newspaper men meet such interesting people. They know the lowdown, now it can be told. I'll tell you quite reliably off the record about some charming people I have known. For I meet politicians and grafters by the score. Killers plain and fancy, it's really quite a bore. Oh, newspaper men meet such interesting people. They wallow in corruption, crime and gore. Tingling ling city. Welcome to the Media Project, a half hour of commentary and analysis on the issues confronting newsrooms these days and the fraught decision making that's going on. I'm Rex Smith, former editor of the Times Union with some veteran journalists. We're here with Judy Patrick, the former editor of the Daily Gazette in Schenectady, and Barbara Lombardo, the former executive editor of the Saratogian and the Record in Troy, and Ian Pickus, the news director for Northeast Public Radio, WAMC. Hello, y'all. Hello. Hello. Here we are. You know, we talk on this program a lot about various kinds of challenges facing journalism. We talk about the economic challenges, the difficulty of keeping the enterprise going in the digital age. We talk about the challenges to the practice of journalism is good reporting. We talk, and this, I think this week we will need to talk about survival of journalists because there is a great threat to journalists actually doing their job in Gaza. So we'll get to all of that. But why don't we actually, why don't we start with the uh, sort of the less fraught part, the economic part. You know, in the in the face of a decline of revenue in a lot of news organizations, there has been a lot of activity, a lot of different things that have been tried. Big news in our industry came out this week when the largest newspaper chain in the country, Gannett, and a uh, sort of a more prestigious chain, McClatchy, both announced that they're going to drop associated press coverage. Gannett owns a couple hundred newspapers, and we call them papers, even though paper is not much important these days in the business of journalism. McClatchy owns about 30 papers. So how do you get by if you don't have the world's largest uh, news organization behind you? Ian, you want to start? This caught my eye because it's a conversation that medium-sized places like WAMC have to have nowadays. And I'll say, on a personal note, there were times in my life where I was surviving off freelancing sports contests and stories for the Associated Press. So I'm so grateful to have had that time in my past working for the AP. But now you've got these major chains who maybe can make something like the AP sink or swim by declining to carry their coverage anymore. At WAMC, I know the number that we pay to subscribe to the AP, which gives us a lot of content we might not otherwise have, including for our website. It's not an insignificant amount of money. Mm. And I could see a lot more places going this way in a time when we know people can find certain news elsewhere. They're right. not necessarily picking up the local paper to find out the latest Biden statement anymore. Right. So that is part of the calculation. Well, you've actually been there, Judy. Didn't you actually make this decision yourself at the Gazette? Boy, did I. Uh, so <laughs> so this came during my tenure as the editor of the Daily Gazette. It was probably 10 years ago. What I was facing was a substantial price increase because they changed how they calculate. They based it in part on, on your subscribers, and they had changed it, and we were facing a huge price increase, and I said, I just can't do that. At the time, I could get the same kind of international coverage from the Washington Post and the New York Times, which were offering services much cheaper. I believe in the Associated Press, the mission, the cooperative mission, the work they do overseas, covering wars, um, covering the economy. And it had a number of really practical problems for me. I lost stock tables at a time when we used to run stock tables. I lost um, agate sports listings. The sports loss was the biggest loss. Mm -hmm. It was something that I couldn't get from. Uh, McClatchy had, was a syndicate at the time as well. Couldn't get the sports information I needed. Stock listings, I couldn't get photos. You, you lost a lot of photos. Even though the Washington Post was providing um, photos, and the New York Times as well, one of the issues with the New York Times was is a lot of people in our market subscribed to the New York Times or, and it was repetitive or it was old. Um, key to my decision making was the fact that the money I could save, I thought I could hire more people that uh. actually, you know, uh, <laughs> editors are so foolish. Editors, yeah, we're we a always bunch of that. suckers. We think if we save the money, we're going to be able to, oh, I can put two or three people in the state capitol and we could really up our state. Yeah, you could if you got to use the money. Right, because at the time, the Associated Press was providing us fairly good state coverage. They had cut back, certainly. So I thought, man, I could get someone in there that could do the stories I needed to be done. 
And so that's the path I pursued. It was a lot of work to compensate for the loss of services. And again, um, I, I since I've left, they've gone back to AP. I'm not sure how the mechanics of that or the finances of that worked. But at the time, you're right. It was enough to buy me a few reporters, except that I didn't. And how did you manage maybe the stock tables, but especially the sports? Because at that period of time, people bought the paper to see those agate scores. So, so how did that work just for you circulation-wise? for yeah. listeners, the term agate is just so that, that is, is the, the, t- little, the mm-hmm. little type that I right. can't see anymore, <laughs> that the baseball, yeah. the box what, scores. The box scores, that's right. the word I'm looking um, for. Uh, Shohei Otani's win-loss record right. and gambling right. debts. <laughs> yeah. So the, so there Not are services just. that will do that, but you had to reformat it and you had to take it in every day. I mean, for example, in our neck of the woods, people wanted the nine the entries in the racing every day. They wanted the the betting lines. There are places you can buy them. AP offers this wonderful service where you pay one fee and you get all of it. Now, did you lose readers? I don't think we... Not enough to offset them. Not enough How to would you offset. be able to tell why readers yeah, were leaving yeah, yeah, is yeah. the problem because we were all losing audience. I the mean, time. the Washington Post office had great feature packages, cooking, mm-hmm. things that I needed. So I think the key issue is election coverage, but the New York Times and the Washington Post reassured me that they would get me the results I needed. That issue is aside now that you go to press at 8 o'clock before the polls close anyway. So it's a tough decision. I understand where they're coming from. AP less and less relies on the membership fees they pay. They get their money from, you know, they resell their images. But I'm sure they're going to take a hit on this, and it's sad, but understandable. I confronted the same issue and came very close. We notified AP of our intent to drop. And because they, you have to a year ahead of time. They came back and uh, made a significant drop in the contract costs. But the difficulty, of course, is that, that that you don't need to be a news organization, we tell ourselves, to cover everything anymore. You don't have to be a comprehensive package because people get stuff. So your primary focus, Barbara, your papers at the time were always very intensely locally focused. So you didn't probably need that much. Well, we did need the Associated Press for a lot of the reasons that Judy cited, the box scores, anything that wasn't happening. Um, outside of the square block that we were located on in Saratoga. We needed it for state coverage, although there was, in the earlier years, Gannett News Service was part of that also, and they covered that for us. But that was gone, and anything that was national or international. And the Associated Press, I thought at the time, did a really good job. And the copy that you need to fill a newspaper that is uh-huh. the meaningful the meaningful copy, the features, the international stories, the national stories, the opinion columns, perhaps. So you're so, still thinking, though, of the print product, and it annoys me, of course, these days when I look at a print okay, newspaper. Okay, well, well, let me back up and just say for a well-rounded product. Ah. So, let's say if it's an online product, you still want something beyond the local Do for you? people. Do you well, need it? not so much anymore, probably, I guess, because yeah. people are getting that from other sources. I think that readers should understand that the Associated Press, Judy used the term a cooperative, that it's not a company that's selling its wares, but that it was, well, I don't know how it's changed now, but it was a cooperative and newspapers were members of the Associated Press and you were expected or hoped for or asked to contribute copy, stories, photos, as well as to use whatever they're providing you for the level of service that you got. And so for us at the Saratogian, I used to take a lot of criticism where people say, oh, your paper's all AP, Associated Press, it's Mm -hmm. all AP. And it's not that it was all AP, but anything that wasn't local was Associated Press because that was our one news service. I was shocked when I became managing editor and saw the budget for the first time, how much money, I don't remember, but it was a shockingly high percentage of our mm-hmm. spending was going to cover. It was that. five reporters for me, so that's well, that must have been twenty for me then. Impact. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's happened here in the time that I've been in the newsroom at WAMC is the decline of the AP's regional offerings has kind of forced us to graduate in our own news production. So it's got kind of a perverse upside for us, and I'll say we get things from the AP that are very helpful international and national headlines, breaking news, photos, sometimes audio. That's that's all great. It's expensive, of course. But what has happened in the time I've been here, we've lost effectively all Vermont coverage from the Associated Press. The state house coverage in places like Connecticut and Massachusetts, which used to be updated on almost an hourly basis, especially during a session, is now down to a story or two maybe a week. 
And that's true here in the state capitol in New York, too. And that has forced our newsroom to get a lot faster and to make just a lot more stuff that we used to be able to lean on the AP to feed. So it's trained a generation of us to amp up our game a little bit and make sure that our, our news is up to date because you can't lean on the AP as much anymore. But that means you need your own staff, and that's a challenge, too, sure. in the uh, economics of this issue. To that end, in the state of New York right now, there is a controversy, a push underway for the Local Journalism Sustainability Act, which is included in the Senate Democratic budget, not in the governor's budget proposal or the assembly's, so we'll see if it gets through. But this is a $20 million tax break statewide that would go to smaller news organizations, that is, entities that have fewer than 100 employees, so you're not going to be giving a tax break to the New York Times, or even, as a matter of fact, to the Times Union, but because it's total number of employees, not just newsroom size. But it would be a tax break for half the payroll tax, up to half the wages, that is, up to $200,000 per organization per year. So this is the idea of giving a tax break to local news organizations so that they could hire more journalists. But there is some question, you know, should news organizations be taking tax breaks? Is this a good thing to do? Yeah, there's a number of versions of, of these around the country, and journalists are grappling with the issue of or the, the ethics of it and what to do. In New York State, you know, people are arguing that we need a little bit of runway. It, it's a five-year program, so after five years, the money will go away unless it's reauthorized, and it would apply not just to newspapers, or but to radio, television stations as well, trying to give them a little bit of breathing room um, especially when it comes to local news coverage, as they're facing this, for many of them, an existential crisis. It's hard for me to be against something that is going to help put more bodies into news coverage, especially at smaller entities. But I'm very skeptical about relying on something that has a short shelf life. And I'm not thinking of it as a runway to fly. You know, bad things happen after takeoff, too, sometimes. <laughs> when, when kind of you, can, you can crash. And it, being reliant on government is a problem. It has worked. Relying on government has worked for public broadcasting so far. Right. The Partially. Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And I think when questions like this come up, it's important to look to those outlets that are really on the margins. There are stations in news deserts in America that would close without funding from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting because a lot of them are one person who's you know, gathering the news and delivering the weather and whatever, pressing the buttons that keep the radio station on the air. Places like ours could probably absorb it a little more when we have more to lose. But you're looking even in New York State that you know there are places that will not have a reporter in their community if that person is not funded in some way. And this could throw a lifeline to a lot of news outlets that desperately, desperately need one. As far as the, the question about whether lawmakers will hold it over the reporters and try to get favorable coverage, I think that always exists. I, I don't think the dynamic would be any different between the press and the state representatives who don't always love the press. Yeah. Well, and we see what happens when politicians get into power who are upset about journalism. Donald Trump, for example, continually says he's going to eliminate funding for public broadcasting, which he considers to be hostile to him, and that he's going to go after the licenses. He's going to demand that the FCC shut down NBC. NBC News being the part that he cares about, presumably not the uh, entertainment programming that provided his platform. <laughs> And now Donald Trump is even suing ABC uh, because George Stephanopoulos had the temerity in an interview to refer to Trump as having been found by a jury that he was liable for rape. Actually, Donald Trump was found liable for sexual abuse, but now both are felonious sexual assaults, so it is a matter of degree. Well, yes, and it's incorrect. What Stephanopoulos said was incorrect. And when I saw that story from the writer with the hell, I went back into Google land to read up on New York penal law of how is rape defined and then how is intercourse defined. I mean, it was a bit of a rabbit hole that I didn't come across totally clearly climbing out of. But to me, Stephanopoulos got it wrong. But, you know, libel law in this nation allows us to be wrong. Uh, he, yes. So he would have to prove that Stephanopoulos had uh, intentional malice, right? 
Moreover, Trump would have to prove that he had a reputation that could be impugned. <laughs> <laughs> and touche. <laughs> Let's yes. keep in mind. I mean, that. that's true. <laughs> it's true. It's, true. You're right. it's and, and, legally true. And Donald Trump has often called for the relaxation of libel laws and the, to make it easier for people to sue for libel, successfully sue for libel. He likes to just sue to sue. Yeah. He sued the New York Times. He sued CNN. He sued the Washington Post all to get a headline saying he's suing them and so that he can say to his crowds, it's unfair that I can't sue them. He's even upset about Fox News, which seems to be doing everything it can to curry his favor, but they were insufficiently supportive of him during the few months that Governor DeSantis was on the campaign trail. And so he is still upset, even though Fox News is doing all it can these days, it seems, to support. Yeah, pretty much forgot to talk about Pence. Yeah. Not, not endorsing him, which is another thing that gets my goat. What, four minutes we ride this week? Four minutes overall, whereas by comparison, MSNBC devoted an hour and 14 minutes to Pence's refusal to endorse Trump. CNN ran an hour and 19 minutes. Fox provides four minutes. So this is the kind of thing, the, the reason that we say that if you are a Fox News viewer, you're not getting the truth because it is a, a sin of omission. It's what they are refusing to air. And we should make the point that his vice president, Mike Pence, refusing to endorse him is a significant news story. It's not like it's just, you know, a once a day kind of thing. This is historic. This is unusual. And he had very clear reasons that he articulated. It needs to be covered. Yeah, they were pretty lame reasons, according to the reports <laughs> I, I read. Oh, you know, their ideological differences, as opposed to saying, yeah, he said I should be hung. <laughs> and he still believes that the election was rigged and wanted me to illegally and properly turn it over. Those would be good reasons. He should, you know, he doesn't mention that, which I think is part of the news. Yeah. But you know you're, what, you're right, Judy, the fact that this is the first time a, a vice presidential partner has said, I'm not endorsing the guy who I served. Hmm. But we've talked about this on the show throughout the run of this campaign so far. You know, the Murdochs might have their issues with Trump, and they definitely tried to get DeSantis promoted as the next in line. It didn't work. They're realists. They're going to get on the team. They're going to support Trump when Trump is a presidential nominee. Hmm. I guess so. You know, it has so changed the dynamic of journalism. And, and I wonder if this would have happened if it weren't for that one terrible immigrant who Donald Trump doesn't talk about, Rupert Murdoch. Uh, if, if we didn't have Rupert Murdoch creating Fox News, would we be in the situation we are now? Would we ever have come to this point? Because that is the first news organization, a legitimate news organization that declared itself to be intentionally giving us a biased news report that would speak to a conservative audience. Would that have happened anyway? You just don't know. It just makes you wonder. And it will continue once Donald Trump's time has passed, either because he doesn't get elected or because he gets elected and he can't, isn't qualified to run for a third term. Well, yet. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Well, that's the big conundrum for media at every level in this country and abroad is how much do you... And there's no one answer. There's a lot of hand-wringing, but no one answer. How much do you cover? What do you ignore? How do you correct it? Do you show everything that is where he wanders and where he clearly is kind of losing it on the in his rallies, it seems? Yes, and do, do you retort every time a lie is uttered? It's, right. uh, He's angry with CNN because they didn't carry his full victory speech after Super Tuesday. We are seeing the cable news networks carry Biden's speeches in full. They do cut away once he gets past the, the newsworthy part of, of it. But um, I think the danger of Aaron Trump live remains. He continues to spout falsehoods. He, you know, uh, Howard Kurtz, the new media critic for the Fox, did a fairly softball interview with him at one point in the last week or so. And he included the he knows that he's he's saying something that's not true when he talks about the faked election that was stolen from him. And he even suggested to Kurtz, who was recording it, that, yeah, you can cut that part out if you want. Well, he let knows me, it's let wrong. me take that down to a more local level. This morning, the morning that we're taping this, I was listening to WAMC this morning, and they had a news story about Elise Stefanik, the congresswoman who covers part of this area. And what troubled me was that uh, the 
the news report quoted her statement. Uh, actually, they, it was audio of her speaking. Yes, it was her, her speaking. speaking, though she doesn't speak to WAMC herself directly. So it was but clearly she, a can She kind of made news by speaking, but there was no retort to her comment, nothing saying. And yeah. I could see, I could understand some of the dilemma. Who's, who's got the time at the local stations to look up everything that she said and to say something? Or is it, do you just let her say it and, and then it's dropped? But by not retorting or refuting, it gives it the weight of truth. Do you have the obligation so, when she talks about how Donald Trump uh, had us uh, the number one oil producer, do you have an obligation then to say, actually, the United States is pumping more oil than it did during the Trump administration? Right, actually, I, the economy's in stronger shape than it was. Do you so, say that in the well, news story? <laughs> I didn't give our news director any advance warning about this. I totally forgot about it until we just started uh, talking about from the Trump. So let's hear from the news director. <laughs> Boy, you know, I don't know the answer to that. I know we talked about meet the press and the question about stopping Congresswoman Stefanik when she says the January 6th hostages, you know, do you let that statement speak for itself or do you say, whoa, 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 right. what do you mean hostages? Uh, then you spend the entire interview talking about that. It's a dilemma. I, I don't have an easy answer to it. I mean, the thing she says, she's a Republican uh, conference leader. She's on the short list to be vice president. You're not going to be able to check every bite for the rest of this election year that Stefanik says. But on the other hand, if they're increasingly not true, is there a point where you stop airing them? Where did she say what was aired on the broadcast? In Congress. You know, they have a weekly GOP briefing. and So it was yesterday. Know. or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it would seem to me that the thing to do for a, a newscast like that in the ideal world would have been to prepare what Rex was saying. Here she said this in Congress, da 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 da, and then and then the follow up line is that in fact. whatever the you know in fact, thank you, Rex, da 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 da, whatever the real, maybe not hearing about every element or but something so that it's not just sitting there as an accepted statement that then people hear, people repeat. And you know the difficult thing in all of these is how much space and time uh, do you give to these stories when you're challenged to actually get across a whole newscast or a whole newspaper. You know, we always run into this problem. We know, you know, most young people are now increasingly getting the news from TikTok. I mean, you talk about low attention span. We here in this program, we tend to, to talk about traditional media, established media, but if we don't learn, we, speaking broadly of journalists, if we don't learn how to do storytelling on TikTok to at least get people into stories. You can't put an investigative piece on TikTok, but if we don't learn how to lure people into our reporting on TikTok, which I don't think America is going to ban, in fact, there will be a way that it will survive, then we're not fulfilling our responsibility to deliver news to the audience that needs it. So that's the hard thing. We're talking about a sort of an elite medium, in a way, in public radio or in newspapering. The masses are looking at a different platform, and we need to be there for them. Erard, I've said this often, that the responsibility is on us to present people the news in a way in which they are comfortable consuming. It's just because they don't want to read our 30-inch opus on Biden's regulation of carbon emissions from cars doesn't mean that they're not interested. We have to find a way to make them interested, explore the new technology. The issue is, of course, do we have the manpower, the money needed to derive those innovations? If we had those darn tax credits, <laughs> we could have there our go. TikTok person. You know, with Stefanik, for example, it would be it would have been helpful if any re local reporter would have an opportunity to have a give and take with Stefanik or any politicians. You, you're not seeing that as much anymore where you can ask a follow-up question or what do you mean or why is that true and this isn't true. I mean, that is something that the journalists of today an obstacle they have that we really didn't have. Back in when I was a reporter in the 80s and 90s, politicians actually talked to us and we had conversations that went places. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, Congressman Jerry Solomon, who was a predecessor. Oh, of man, I had, used to have debates with him. <laughs> he was fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he, they, they needed us. I mean, that's the difference. Yeah. Speaking of stories that just don't get told, as we uh, wind down today, we needed to pay attention to the mounting death toll of journalists in Gaza. At least 95 journalists since the October 7th terror attack have been killed in the region. 90 of those 95 are Palestinians. This is according to the Committee to Protect Journalists. There are questions of whether the Israeli Defense Forces have intentionally turned on reporters. These need to be examined, but I think the important thing for consumers is to realize how little of the storytelling is getting through because of the danger of actually covering this stuff and 
how brave it is of these journalists who are still wading into the conflict to try to give us the story. So, Right. These reported incidents are real and serious, and the idea of, of wearing a jacket with the word press doesn't protect you. It's never completely protected you in a war zone, but the deaths there need to be recognized, and, and the amount of information we're not getting needs to be appreciated. Yes, yes. I so appreciate I am so grateful for the people who are willing to put themselves in harm's way, and the governments under which these people are getting killed, in this case it happens to be the Israeli government and the Palestinian journalists, the public, the world needs answers. All right, with that, we're done for the day. It's the Media Project. That was uh, Barbara Lombardo. You just heard Judy Patrick before that. Ian Pickett's at WAMC. I'm Rex Smith in the Upstate American. We're grateful to our producer, David Gustina. Especially, we're grateful to you for joining us this week, and we hope you will again next week on the Media Project. Now, newspaper men meet such interesting people. It must have startled poor old Sadie's aunt. ting a ling a ling city desk. Hold the press, hold the press. Extra, extra, read all about it. It's a mess and meets the test. Oh, newspaper men meet such interesting people. Like the richest girl who could not bake a cake. ting a ling ting a ling ling a ling a ling Now, newspaper men are such interesting people. They used to work like hell just for romance. The Media Project is a national production of WAMC, Northeast Public Radio. This week's projectors include former Times Union editor and current Substack columnist of the Upstate American, Rex Smith, Judy Patrick, former editor of the Daily Gazette and vice president for editorial development for the New York Press Association, Barbara Lombardo, the former editor of the Saratogian and a journalism professor at the University at Albany, and WAMC News Director Ian Pickus. You can listen to The Media Project anytime at wamcpodcast.org or anywhere you get your podcast. I'm your producer, David Gustina. Thanks for listening. Now, publishers of such interesting people, their policy is an acrobatic thing. They claim to represent the common people. It's funny Wall Street never has complained. Ah, but publishers have worries, for publishers must go To working folks for readers and to big shots for their dough Now publishers are such interesting people It could be prostitution, I don't know Ting-a-ling-a-ling, circulation, ting-a-ling-a-ling Advertising, get those readers, get that payoff What a headache, what a mess Oh, publishers are such interesting people Let's give free cheers for freedom of the press